This video is sponsored by HelloFresh. After the last glacial period, the climate of Europe grew warmer and more stable. By 10,000 BC, in the Mesolithic era, the hunter-gatherers of Europe were thriving in a range of environments, from the Atlantic coasts in the west, to the river valleys of the steppes in the east. And from 7,000 BC, the first Neolithic farmers around the Aegean in Southeast Europe spread across the continent in two main waves, bringing a new way of life, new languages, beliefs and social structures. Then around 3000 BC, another great change came, with the spread of steppe herders from their homelands on the Pontic Steppe all the way to the furthest corners of Europe, heralding the beginning of the European Bronze Age. These three eras saw huge social, linguistic and genetic changes, but perhaps the most dramatic differences are to be found in their approaches to food. Every day, the people of these societies dedicated themselves to procuring sufficient nutrition to, at a minimum, avoid starvation. But food meant much more than that. What they ate depended on what was available in their environment, what they grew or raised themselves, and what they traded for. The resources they utilized were dependent on their technology and their cultural traditions. So, what did prehistoric Europeans eat? This video is sponsored by HelloFresh. I've been using their service for weeks now and can highly recommend it. The basic idea is they provide delicious recipes you make with fresh, wholesome ingredients delivered right to your door. This cuts out the hassle of weekly meal planning, grocery shopping and deciding what to eat each night. They have 40 weekly recipes to choose from for all meal occasions, lifestyles and preferences. And the biggest benefit for us has been broadening the variety of what we eat each week. I like to make sure I get plenty of protein with every meal, so I look for the Protein Smart Tag on their menu to find recipes featuring 30 grams or more of protein. And you can customise select meals by swapping proteins or sides, or even adding protein to a veggie dish. You can even upgrade for organic chicken or organic beef on select meals. Making sure we get proper nutrition at home is really important to me, and with HelloFresh you're getting seasonal ingredients picked at peak ripeness. Their ingredients travel from the farm to your home in less than seven days, so you know they're fresh. Amongst the meals I made this week was this pork penne pasta. The directions were really easy to follow, the portion size was great, and the final taste was honestly excellent. So if you're looking for pre-portioned ingredients, foolproof recipes, and convenient doorstep delivery that saves you time and money, then go to hellofresh.com and use code dandavishistory60 for 60% off plus free shipping. That's hellofresh.com and use code dandavishistory60 for 60% off plus free shipping. Thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring the video. The Mesolithic era saw hunter-fisher forager groups thriving right across the continent in a range of environments. We might imagine these pre-farming societies roamed widely, leading a kind of rootless, nomadic existence, but generally speaking, these groups were less mobile than one would think. And of course, they tended to live where food could be readily found. For Mesolithic Europeans, that often meant living on the coast, where they gathered shellfish in enormous quantities. We know this in part because of the many shell middens left by these ancient communities. These were mounds of discarded shells placed by the people who harvested them, piling them up over generations until they sometimes grew to enormous sizes. These middens were constructed from Denmark to the British Isles and Ireland down to Portugal, and many have been carefully excavated by archaeologists, revealing a host of fascinating information about the societies who made them. So we know that Mesolithic people gathered, cooked and ate species like oysters, periwinkles and mussels, as well as limpets, whelks, cockles and scallops. Middens also show that Mesolithic Europeans ate crab and lobster, and these middens also contain the bones of fish species like pollock, dogfish, rays, and trout. Shellfish and other seafood provided excellent sources of protein as well as other vital nutrients like various fats and micronutrients like iron, zinc, magnesium, B vitamins, and vitamins E and D. Middens also show that in places where seals were available, these people consumed them in large quantities. Seals provided useful things like skins, bones and oils, but their meat was also incredibly nutritious and the blubber was an important source of calories. In fact, many of these coastal communities in places like Norway and Denmark specialised in seal hunting, 
allowing for relatively high population densities. But these coastal groups did not only rely on coastal food sources. The evidence shows they also consumed terrestrial foods like boar, elk, red and roe deer, aurochs and small game. And in the early northern Swedish Mesolithic they also ate reindeer. Of course, not all Mesolithic groups lived on the coast. The famous site of Star Car in North Yorkshire, England, was a lakeside location surrounded by woodland where generations of people ate mammals like roe deer, beaver, badger and hedgehog, as well as birds like the great crested grebe, the common crane and the lapwing, as well as freshwater fish species. Now, not all animal remains at sites like this were necessarily used primarily for food. Some species might appear because their fur or feathers were wanted, although even in these cases surely the meat was also consumed. Mesolithic people did not just eat animals. However, evidence of plant foods can leave less obvious traces for archaeologists to find after thousands of years. The Star Car site was surrounded by plants like bulrushes, fruit species like blackberries, pears, apples, raspberries and crowberries and seeded plants like water lily that would surely have been prepared and eaten. One thing that does show up under the right conditions is hazelnut shells. Mesolithic people across Europe loved hazelnuts and sites like Duvensee in northern Germany show clear evidence for intensive seasonal gathering and preparation at special hazelnut processing sites. They were roasted in batches in earth ovens. Heating the nuts destroys contaminants, improves the flavour and extends the shelf life. Roasting them also made them easier to crack and grind. Discarding those shells and processing the nuts into flour or paste also reduced the weight and volume, making the food easier to transport. Several sites in Scotland show similar patterns of hazelnut gathering. One site on the island of Colonsay revealed a pit with 30 to 40,000 intact but charred hazelnuts weighing 16 kilograms, along with lesser celandine tubers, crab apples, seeds, charcoal and stone tools. It's not clear what this pit was, but one suggestion is it shows the disposal of an accidentally charred batch of nuts. They could have been roasting a total of between 120 and 330,000 hazelnuts here, one batch of which was ruined and disposed of. So a day or two of roasting these hundreds of thousands of hazelnuts could provide millions of calories. It was an incredibly important resource across temperate Europe. One thing everyone knows about Mesolithic foragers is that their economies were fundamentally different to the Neolithic farmers who replaced them. Hunter-gatherers did not manage plants and animals or change their environments in any way. Only, that isn't really true. The domestication of plants and animals was a complex, very long-term process and hunter-gatherer societies often used sophisticated systems of wild plant and animal management that didn't necessarily lead to domestication. Plant food management or husbandry can involve deliberate strategies designed to increase productivity and control over plant resources. For example, protective plant tending, selective burning of woodland, weeding and soil modification. It does not necessarily include sowing or planting of wild seeds, although perhaps they did that too. Finding evidence of intensive plant gathering and processing of foods like hazelnut, water chestnuts and acorns cannot by itself tell us about potential management practices. So archaeologists use other methods like ancient pollen analysis to reconstruct prehistoric landscapes because certain plants, shrubs and trees only grow in specific environments. Methods like these have shown woodlands at analysed sites across Mesolithic Europe experienced periodic clearing of trees. Some sites show corresponding evidence of burning and they can even tell when sites were kept clear of trees for extended periods, suggesting ongoing management. The advantages of managing woodland like this would include the propagation of edible species in the shrub layer, like hawthorn and especially hazel. Some researchers believe that they detect the spread of hazel woodland beyond the area of natural distribution. We therefore see Mesolithic people using what you could call proto-farming methods to create and manage wild hazelnut orchards for their ongoing seasonal exploitation. And amazingly, they didn't only manage plant resources. 
Where landscapes were poor in animals, they also seem to have been imported and managed. My favourite example of this is the possibility that the land snail, Capia nemoralis, was transported from Iberia to Ireland during the Mesolithic. There is genetic evidence that, for some researchers, suggests Mesolithic foragers were managing or farming land snails for food, a practice which started in Iberia and was carried over the generations all the way to Ireland. But Mesolithic people did not only introduce small animals to new environments. After the last glacial maximum, the retreat of glaciers and the rise of sea levels, many islands from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean were left without certain animal species. Using archaeological and genetic evidence, researchers can tell when various species were then intentionally introduced by humans who wanted to hunt them. This happened with wild boar in many places like Ireland, where they were also tightly controlled by regular culling. Amazingly, it seems that brown bears were also introduced by people to Ireland. We are forced to imagine how this was done. Presumably, juvenile animals were taken, after their mothers were killed, by canoe to these islands and were then released to breed and found populations that could be hunted and eaten. Wild boar were also introduced to multiple islands in the Aegean during the Mesolithic, the Aegean is also the location where the first farmers of Europe began their long process of spreading throughout the continent, bringing with them a host of domesticated plants and animals, and changing the landscape of Europe forever. So what did the Neolithic farmers eat? There were between 200 and 450 wild edible plant species in European temperate and Mediterranean regions including green leafy plants, seaweed, roots and rhizomes, nuts, grass seeds and fruits. Many of these plants were concentrated in wetland habitats, lake shores and along the coasts, which also drew concentrations of the hunter-fisher forager groups who lived there. The Neolithic in Europe is characterised by the introduction of plant cultivation and animal husbandry as the foundational economic activities. It also represents a marked narrowing of the breadth of the diet to a focus on a handful of domesticated cereals and pulses and a few domesticated animals like sheep, goat, cattle and pigs. The effect this had on the populations living like this meant the people individually tended to be less healthy than the hunter-fisher foragers. They were shorter and suffered more diseases and had more dental problems. But this lifestyle meant the production of greater food resources being produced from less mobile groups, leading to an increase in the birth rate and larger populations. This way of life began in the Fertile Crescent and spread to the Aegean by about 7000 BC. From there, the people spread in two main directions. One southerly route went by the Mediterranean coasts, eventually reaching Iberia. The other spread through the Balkans into Central Europe. The final expansion into Northern Europe and the British Isles and Ireland took place from around 4000 BC. These farmers grew and ate domesticated cereals like einkorn and emma wheat, hulled barley and a range of pulses like pea, lentil and chickpea, and they raised pigs, as well as sheep, goats and cattle. They ate these latter animals of course, but they also kept them for their milk, which was consumed as dairy products in various forms. Archaeologists know this because they are able to test food residues preserved inside ceramic pottery for telltale chemical signals. And this evidence shows up in the very earliest farming communities in Greece, so dairy was always an important part of their diet. And cattle specifically started to dominate the farming cultures as they spread through the Balkans towards Central Europe. Now, these people were almost entirely lactose intolerant. However, it didn't stop them consuming plenty of dairy products. Processing the raw milk into different products like cheese, yogurt and butter usually makes them digestible for lactose intolerant people. Even then, some lactose intolerant people are able to consume raw milk without suffering many negative symptoms. The genes for adult lactase persistence didn't become widespread in Europe until the Bronze Age, thanks initially to the spread of the European steppe herders and then to ongoing selection effects that still aren't well understood. However, dairy foods have been vitally important to Europeans for the last 8,000 years. In fact, by the late Neolithic, in places like the North European Plain, in Britain and especially in Ireland, 
it seems that the people there relied ever more on dairy and cattle pastoralism rather than the growing of crops. But going back to the early Neolithic, the relationships of the expanding farmer groups with the hunter-gatherers were varied and complex. Some sites, like the famous Lepensky Veer on the Danube, show evidence of the mixing between these two lineages and two distinct ways of life. This mixing happened repeatedly throughout Europe, although as the farming populations were so much larger, their genetics and their way of life ultimately dominated. Other interactions were undoubtedly hostile, while other groups seem to have lived somewhat separately for generations, each occupying different kinds of environments, the farmers thriving on fertile alluvial soils, and the hunter-gatherers in their coastal or lakeside regions, seemingly ignoring one another. Neolithic populations generally did not consume freshwater fish or seafood, despite having access to coasts, rivers and lakes. It's hard to say why they would have ignored such nutritious and readily available food. Perhaps it was because they were just so committed to farming that they had no spare time for it. It could be that they didn't really know how. After all, fishing isn't easy, even with practice and modern equipment, and even knowing where and how to gather and prepare shellfish might have been lost knowledge amongst them. However, although they didn't eat fish, they did hunt wild animals to supplement their domestic food sources, so it's possible they had a cultural aversion to fish, a dietary taboo. And could it be that fish-eating was associated with the fish-loving hunter-gatherer societies and so was seen as somehow undesirable or even disgusting? It's difficult to detect these kinds of cultural trends in prehistory, but it's incredibly interesting to me and I will make a dedicated video about the possible fish-eating taboo in future. As populations expanded from Southeast Europe into colder, wetter Central Europe, they also had to adapt their farming methods by abandoning crops that didn't grow well in the new environment, like lentil and chickpea, leading to an even narrower range of crops and a greater focus on emma and einkorn wheat. Although they did keep growing peas, flax and poppy in Central Europe, they also tended to rely more on cattle and pigs than sheep and goats. Archaeology suggests that dairy was important as a daily food source for Neolithic farmers, while slaughtering them for their meat may have been more commonly reserved for communal feasting activities. Some sites, for example in southern Britain, show evidence that cattle were driven to special locations to be slaughtered, roasted and consumed in huge feasts that no doubt accompanied ritual activities at special times of the year. They also liked slaughtering and feasting on pigs too. These animals, while they were alive, were a vitally important source of manure, which was spread as fertilizer to boost crop yields and maintain long-term field systems instead of slash-and-burn type agriculture that necessitated constant woodland clearances. As these Neolithic groups spread eastwards through Europe, from about 5000 BC, they encountered hunter-gatherer groups living in the river valleys in the steppe and forest steppe zones of Eastern Europe, north of the Black Sea and the Caspian. Unlike in the rest of Europe, the farmers did not continue to spread into this region, outbreeding the local hunter-gatherers. Neither did the hunter-gatherers adopt wholesale the entire Neolithic package of crops and animals. Instead, after about 4700 BC, the hunters adopted primarily cattle and sheep and ultimately became animal herders. Why they would choose to do this isn't known, although perhaps they were awed by the farmers' great abundance and large populations and were inspired to emulate them by adopting domesticated animals. And exactly how this adoption process happened isn't clear either. It's assumed that the animals were traded in exchange for resources provided by the hunter-gatherers, although perhaps the animals were stolen, rustled and driven off by these bad neighbours. But it's not enough to simply possess the animals, they had to learn how to manage them too. So it could be the hunter-gatherers learned by observation, or they were instructed how to do it in the spirit of peaceful cooperation. One intriguing possibility, although this is just my speculation, is that the farmers employed the hunter-gatherers initially as managers and guards for their own herds, and perhaps it wasn't always an equal relationship. By around 3500 BC, these Eastern European hunter-gatherer populations had become dedicated pastoralists, 
specialising most of all in cattle, as well as sheep, and growing little to no crops at all. They took advantage of the vast grasslands between the river valleys to pasture their herds, converting all that grass into milk and meat. And inspired by their adoption of cattle, they also domesticated the wild horses that lived on the steppes and utilised them for their milk and meat. These steppe cultures thrived so well that some of them, at the end of the Neolithic era, moved westwards, taking advantage of the decline of the settled farming populations west of the river Dnieper. While the people of the European steppe continued to be pastoralists, their relatives established what we call the corded ware culture through much of the rest of Central and Northern Europe. It was long believed that the corded ware culture were also pastoralists because they were known almost entirely from their grave sites rather than the settlements. However, as more settlement sites are studied, a more nuanced view is emerging. It seems that in some places in Corded Ware Europe, cattle pastoralism certainly dominated, while other sites show evidence of mixed agriculture, much like the Neolithic system that came before it. The full range of Neolithic era plants and animals were utilised, and new varieties of crops were developed or imported. So after the narrowing of foods that occurred in the Neolithic, Europe saw a broadening of foods being grown from the Chalcolithic and into the Bronze Age. By the Late Bronze Age, as well as the old wheat crops, rye began to be cultivated, as did oats and more varieties of millet that had spread to Europe all the way from China. These new crops were suitable for different soil types and climates, enabling more land to be utilised. For example, oats were better for cold climates, while millet was more drought resistant. Pulses, lentils and flax were grown in new regions. This trend toward increasing diversity of food production continued into and through the Bronze Age as the population grew larger, bringing more land into cultivation and improving its productivity. Food technology also advanced, along with increased long-distance trade for things like salt, which allowed for longer-term storage of meat which in turn led to healthier, more resilient and larger populations, a trend that continued into the Bronze Age and beyond. If you'd like to see more about prehistoric salt production, ancient fishing methods and the possible fish-eating taboo, then please subscribe now so you don't miss these videos in future. And there was an incredible opportunity for archaeologists to examine the food consumed by one Chalcolithic individual because it was actually preserved inside his stomach. To find out what this man's last meal was, please watch my video on the Tyrolean Iceman here, or check out my Bronze Age History playlist for more interesting subjects like this. Thank you for watching.